so in this session, we're going to look at UAS Master, which is um, essentially the photogrammetry pro package that uh, Trimble offers. Uh, the package itself is kind of, it's a separate package currently, and you can use the package independently of TBC, but the workflow we're going to look at today is specifically looking at um, that link between TBC and UAS Master, why it exists, and uh, the benefits for it. Um, in this session, we're going to look at setting up a project in TBC and what you would need to do in the TBC side of things and then sending that to um, UAS Master and setting up the project in there. Uh, we're going to look at creating the tie points, producing reports, creating a surface. Uh, sorry, when I say surface, I mean a point cloud um, surface. Then creating an ortho photo and then sending the data back to TBC. And then we'll have a quick look in TBC at some of the tools that we've got in there. And though that's the slide component, then we'll do a demo um, at the end. And at the very end, there'll be questions. Um, I, just to keep the flow, we'll ask that any questions you have, just stick them in the chat and we can answer them all at the end. Uh, Shep will quite happily answer questions on the fly, I'm sure, as we go through it as well. So um, yeah, look, let's, let's take a look. Um, for those that don't know you, I'm Ross McAtamney. I'm one of the technical consultants at UPG based in Melbourne. I did work at Trimble for 11 years before coming across to UPG, um, working in product management and technical support for Quantum and also uh, Trimble Business Center. So US, UAS Master is a photogrammetry grade processing um, package for unmanned aerial surveys for close range and also um, aerial so above above ground um, so the difference there is there are two systems that you can put the UAS master in one is an aerial top down looking at the the ground sort of uh, processing and the other one is a close range processing for say if you're flying around buildings or structures or that sort of more vertical 3d element both of those packages are contained the, both of those options are contained within UAS master there is a split in the system to depending on which one you want to use and there are some slight differences between the two in how you can process the points um, and how you set up projects but overall the the same core components are in both both sort of streams um, uas master does not need tbc to work you can use uas master um, by itself however um, the workflow with tbc means that we can send data between um, our familiar environment of TBC into US Master and sort of have that data set up and ready to go. It's sort of there for doing things like um, control points and setting projections so that you can tie aerial data into your terrestrial survey. Um, the it also means that there's a single location for editing the data if you use it within TBC um, in the sense that uh, you can have all of your data together in the one area and edit sort of simultaneously with any sort of line work or other points that you might have. The basic workflow for UAS Master is that um, the field work is captured. In the field work, there are two components that you'll have. You'll have your essentially GCP locations, which can be either GPS or they could be a shot location, um, and the photo. Um, component which is the drone essentially. Uh, what we'll do in TBC is set the projection and take the GCPs or identify any points that we want to handle as GCPs um, and send those to UAS Master so that component is handled and managed and sufficient in the package when you use them and the in UAS Master is where we will introduce the photos. So TBC doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with the photos um, in, in this current workflow. Um, the process is then done in UAS Master where you go through, tie the aerial images to the ground points that you may have collected, and then you um, send the data back to TBC where you can continue your, your editing. Um, this workflow may change down the track. Uh, there is looking, we are looking at, or Trimble's looking at putting in more of this component into TBC itself to streamline this process. However, UAS Master will still exist. It's still a, a very good package. Um, one thing we will note is that it is a um, photogrammetry grade package. So it is, it does have a lot of um, options involved with this workflow, uh, but it will return a, a, a more 
optimal uh, result out, out at the end than some of the other packages. Um, the way that we would sort of see it is Stratus is the, the very simplified version of, of point cloud processing. Pix4D sits in the middle and UAS Master is sort of more that advanced end. However, in saying that, you can create a workflow in UAS Master that's very streamlined, uh, easy to follow. And if you keep on top of it, you know where things are at so that um, you're able to process quite good terrain models from your data. Within the UIS master application, the process is basically we import the images and set up the project. We basically tie the, the images together so that by that we mean that um, the images are sort of overlapped so that we know their GPS location based on their EXIF data and we can work out where those images, images basically lie. There's a tie point extraction which will create a whole heap of points throughout all the images and tie, the Im tie them together so that we have a, a good set of overlap of those images and we know where they all are located against one another. Then we use we tie those to GCPs or ground control points. Now a ground control point can be a shot point, it can be an identified point, it can be a measured point. Uh, it's basically just a coordinate that you can see from the photos that you know that physical location for. The reason why we use ground control points is that we want to accurately locate the image cluster over the ground so that we can properly position it in place. It also can be used for generating height um, information within the, the, um, the project. So be aware that if you're wanting to get the information, say, off a roof line or things like that, you'd want to have some GCPs on the corner or some points on the corners of your um, your roof line to make sure that you have something sufficiently tied to, uh, to for the system to tie to so that you can get that height um, better calibrated within the system. If you don't have that, then you might find, and I'll show you a, a screenshot later, um, that the, the roof line will not sit properly against the, um, the, the rest of it. So having GCPs in the right location is a very important um, aspect of the whole process. Um, UAS Master will also calibrate the camera, so it will reverse engineer the camera calibration to help optimize the, the, the surface generation process. Then we, it can be used to create surfaces and orthophotos to send them back to TBC or as just to, to send them out. So you don't actually need to bring the data back into TBC. When you've generated a surface and an orthophoto, it's stored in the project folder and you can just access them there and send them on if you wanted to. So the workflow is that, as I've mentioned, TBC is used to set up a project. Um, in TBC, we set up a, a, essentially like a blank project. You could use a blank template, and then we have our GCPs. Uh, like I've mentioned already, the GCPs can be, uh, say, a target across. It could be a corner of a building if you're confident you can see it uh, in the images, um, but it's it's something that will tie the um, the image to a physical coordinate on the ground. And you do need that X, Y, Z aspect of a coordinate on the ground. And it will, it will need to be shot. It shouldn't be taken from just a, a sort of a, an arbitrary uh, location. You want the GCP location to be as specific as possible. Um, the In TBC, we can turn on background maps when you've got it um, in Trimble Connect. So for users that aren't actually out in the field on the day, and want to, and need to process the data. This is actually a really good uh, place to identify where a GCP is located, so that down the track they know what they're looking for in the in the images. Um, generally, to, uh, UAS Master will show you where a GCP is located, and there's a fairly good um, um, sort of area that it looks for, and, and it'll be fairly close in its approximation. But um, having this background map option to see where the GCPs are located is quite handy so that you can, um, um, you know, if you're not out in the field, you, you have some form of idea of what the, uh, the GCP name is and where to look in, the, in the, the photos. Once you're ready in UAS Master, you go to the photogrammetry tab. Now the photogrammetry module is a separate module that is purchased in TBC. Um, it's a standalone module similar to the point clouds module. If you are going down the photogrammetry module path, I'd recommend looking at both the photogrammetry module and the point clouds module, as the point clouds tab will have a lot of tools that will be useful once the data comes back into TBC. And in this step, you just go send to UAS Master. In here, it says which version are you going to send it to, um, what 
the coordinate system is. Uh, basically, it's just saying this is the coordinate system that I'm using in TBC uh, and what I'm going to be sending to UAS Master. And then you select the points. So again, like everything in TBC, this point selection option doesn't have to be specifically uh, all the data. It can be a subset of the data and you can manu manually select points. So if you had a, say, um, uh, a topo survey that you were you were tying to aerial data you could just select the control points that you want to use or the the points that you've made that um, you know their location of and send those through in this case we've selected five points they've just been a simple five points that were measured out in the field so when the data comes into UAS master you can see a it's a new package so the view and the ui is different they did do a modification in version 10 which is the last sort of the last major release that um, came out. Uh, if anyone's using UAS Master, the current released version of UAS Master is 10.0.2. Every version that they release has some tweaks and modifications to it. So um, when I started, I was using version 8. In now in version 10, the process is a lot simpler and captures a lot more of the workflow in, in a more streamlined manner and also is a lot more robust. So it is quite a robust system for handling different processes in the, in the, um, in the workflow. So when you come to UAS Master, the, the first thing that you would do is that you notice you can hit the um, Zoom Extents and you'll see all of your control points sitting in a green field. So this is a plan view, it's a top-down view. There's a dome in the middle of the view. This is how you, um, you view and rotate the view in UAS Master. The way that you would do that is you hover over the red line and you write mouse click and that will and drag and that will rotate in a um, north south axis in the in looking at the screenshot and then in the green axis it's an uh, east west rotation and the blue is sort of rotating around so it is uh, that that disk is there to to help uh, locate the data when you're rotating it around. In US Master, we will go through this in the workflow, uh, in the demonstration, but you would import the images. Uh, it's called, they're called frames in US Master, um, and you set up their parameters in the sense that you give the system an idea of what the height of the terrain is, which you can pull from um, TBC if you don't know it. It's just a basic height. It doesn't need to be accurate. It's just giving it a ballpark figure to start with. And then also in there, you, you would do um, how high the flight was. This information can be gathered from the, um, the photos themselves, but it is good to just enter this information in so that UAS Master has that specific starting point to look at. Um, there's also some tolerances that you can set. So depending on the type of camera that you're using, um, depends on how much tolerance you're gonna allow in the processing. Um, for example, a Mavic 2 would be a low end camera, so you'd want a little bit more tolerance to, to, to be set. A, a Phantom 4 is, is a little bit better, so you wouldn't have so much tolerance that you would need to, to deal with. And then sort of the high-end uh, drone capture devices, EBs, those sorts of things, you won't need to set that tolerance. You won't really need to change it. The, the default setting is fairly sufficient. The final thing that you would do in this, this process would be to generate the strips. So the strips are essentially, it goes through all the photos and works out what photo is starting and then where the next photo is in relationship to that and it'll create the lines that essentially were the flight paths. In um, UAS Master you can import all this data in, in, independently if you wanted to. Uh, for Phantom 4 RTKs you would need to do that um, because you've got that sort of external GPS location to more accurately determine the location of each of the photo points but um, if you're just dealing with the raw photos yourselves, this is just the basic workflow and you can you can generate a fairly good solution out of it. Be aware that you can generate a fairly good solution with a Mavic 2. Um, it will take a little bit more fiddling. There is a lot more um, movement that you'll find in the results for, for say, a Mavic 2 um, compared to a high-end drone where the more money you spend, the better results you are going to get out of the system. So that is a consideration um, of what sort of quality you want your result to be. A, a Mavic will produce a decent result and the workflow that we're going to go through now will look at some photos that were taken with a Mavic, but but it's not ideal necessarily for, for survey grade um, processing. 
So once the main view is generated with information that you're looking, once you click save on your imported data, um, the, the main view will populate with your information. So in the screenshot on the right here, you can see that there are yellow um, rectangles. They are the rectangles representing each of the photo locations. The blue lines are representing the flight paths. The green triangles are representing the uh, GCP locations. So all the information that we've currently got is in the view. Now you'll notice too, as we work through this process, the the this view will change and update with the information that we, we are adding to it. So um, this is just sort of the entry point. Um, the thing that you will notice too is that when you've got the yellow um, photos, they're only yellow at the moment because we we have only just imported them. Um, when they are used, these photo these colors will change. The other thing you'll notice is once you've saved the data um, and imported all this information, we can now have access to the georeferencing tool. So UAS Master will allow you, to, it essentially works through the steps of, of what it can do. So it won't let you do a step that you don't have, you haven't done the previous needed step to do. So in this case, it'll be georeferencing. So when you open the georeferencing tool, the idea of this tool is to initially show you what the data is looking like. You can see things like check the overlap of the images. Um, you can um, see what your the where everything sort of sits in relation to one another. The first step you would take here would be to generate the tie points in the images. So that will go through and automatically process all the images and create a whole heap of points, which it will use to tie the images together. It just works out common points between the photos and um, and sort of ties the whole set together. Once you once it's done that, it now has a basis to be able to tie the whole set to the GCP. So the the next step is to um, connect the uh, tied images to the GCPs and you just go through and select them manually sort of uh, in the photos. Now I say manually, but you can select two points and then have the system automatically work out the rest of the locations based off your initial points. Um, it is quite a straightforward process, which I'll, I'll run through in the demonstration. In this process, it's going to do a camera calibration as well. So in the background, it's determining what errors are associated with the camera, what the what the lens is looking like, all of that sort of thing. Um, so you can do a, a, an orientation step, which basically will just go through and tighten up the network based on what's going on with the cameras. And then when you've done that, you, you're able to generate the reports. Now, the reports are quite detailed coming out of UAS Master. It is a, a fairly high level, uh, sorry, a detailed level report that looks at everything from where pixels may be moving from one location to another or the uh, the actual lens distortion itself uh, is captured in the report. So you have that confidence in knowing what has gone on in the processing of, the, of your data. Um, there are also some um, properties and um, tools to investigate the data to show uh, where G how many points are going to a GC, uh, how many photos are over a GCP and where the photos have come from um, and all that sort of thing can be done in here too so that you do have that confidence in knowing what your data is looking like. Once you've done that uh, georeferencing step and you've tied everything together and you've tied it to the ground. As you notice in the screen here, there are, the photo frames are now green. So we're saying, yes, we these are all right to go. If for some reason there are some photos that are not in um, tolerance, they will be still yellow um, and they're highlighting a photo that hasn't been used in the process. So green will indicate in this case, all the photos that are being used in this process. You'll also notice, which it is a little bit hard to see in this main view here, that um, the tie points will, will actually be shown on the ground. It's a very fine, basic uh, terrain model generation um, and it, it, they will be shown in this view. Uh, if you rotate around, you can also see where the height of the camera is against in relationship to your terrain, which is a good way of problem solving. You can identify if things have gone wrong um, and if there is a difference in the sense that your terrain height is out of to uh, out of relationship with your, your flight height or something bigger is going on. Um, the, the main view here is very good at showing you how the project is currently being tied together. The next step that you would take is the radiometric uh, step. This uh, radiometric optimization basically goes through all the photos 
Uh, it looks at their relationship to one another and adjusts for color and a bit of blending to make sure that you're getting an optimal uh, colorization of your photos and that it's all sort of uniform and that you're not having these sorts of white out sections or very dark sections. Um, it is recommended to run this step, but be aware that if you do have uh, cases where the, there is white, very uh, there's a big difference between photos and images. You may find that the things start to be pushed out of tolerance a little bit and it may not be worth running this step, but I would generally run this step unless there is an issue. So when it comes to the surface generation in, in UAS Master, there are several ways that you can um, run a surface generation. Um, the initial, the, the terrain, uh, surface generation is just a very basic uh, generation that is uh, looks over just essentially creates a, a coarse point cloud over the terrain and looks mainly at the terrain it tries to sort of uh, make sure that it keeps the terrain points in and doesn't really look at the the resulting the, the trees or buildings or those sorts of things um, but then as you work through this list here there is several options that allow you to get more detailed um, you'll also find that some options are better for some reasons than uh, some applications than others so a cbm surface generation is generally better for natural surface so say a paddock or something like that whereas an sgm is better for a built environment um, there are also options associated with each of the the results in the sense that you can pick um, a maximum and minimum number of photos for some of the more advanced surface generation options this means that you can say i want a minimum of four photos to be used to identify a point which will it will mean that your point cloud is smaller however you'll get probably a better result you're not dealing with sort of the edges of photos so much and the same with maximum it will try and identify the photos it will try and use the photos that are straight up and down as opposed to the edges of photos more so you may get rid of some of the noise that might be generated this can th this whole process is really tied to how much confidence you have in your drone how many photos you've captured um, how much time you have to generate a, a, a surface these options are there to to help you um, um, sort of work through this whole process to make sure that you are you are um, you have the options to generate a quick surface if you need to or spend some time in detail uh, generating a, a quite a good surface in the end um, there are also uh, options for high, medium and low um, extraction. So you can sort of say, I just want a, a, a detailed extraction or I want a basic extraction based on all of these, these um, surface generation types. It is worth looking through and seeing what options are available. Generally though, if you're just wanting to get the data out of UAS Master and put it into, um, a po get a point cloud out, the, the default settings for each of those are generally pretty good. Um, you, you shouldn't need to spend a lot of time in changing them. Um, and, you know, it's just there for your confidence to know that you can start to uh, become more advanced if you need to. So once you run this step, now this step, it can take time. So in the example that we've got um, the, for this particular data set, um, it, it was taking about six and a half, well, six, almost seven minutes to generate the, the more detailed surface models. So it, it is quite quick, relatively speaking, um, because you've done that setup work to get to this point. Um, but the more the bigger the project, the more detail there is, the longer the step will take. So it is something to be aware of when, when processing data. Once you've processed your, uh, your point cloud, you can then run through and generate ortho photos, or you can bypass the point cloud step and just go straight into generating ortho photos. Um, if you cancel out on the, the fly, this will allow you to just generate those photos um, that you might want to use. But generally, uh, I would generate the ortho photos after I've created a terrain model. Now, there's basic editing that can be done in UAS Master if you need to. There's a, there is a, I say basic, there is a fairly extensive set of tools that you can use to edit them. Um, it is a different set of tools, different workflow to editing in UAS Master than to say TBC. So I wouldn't recommend necessarily using those tools unless you feel confident that those tools have something to offer you more than in TBC or another package. Um, the, the option is there to use them. And that, while I say there are some good tools in this workflow, and generally speaking, I would recommend taking the data back to TBC where you might be more familiar with the, the process. So once the data's 
complete in UAS Master, your view will update again. So um, again, you'll, you'll have the, that information that you've, you've built up and you have that confidence. You can rotate around, see what the relationship with everything is, make sure that you're happy. If you need to regenerate a surface, you can regenerate it quite quickly in UAS Master. So you will just regenerate the surface step. You don't need to go back to the georeferencing step and do all of those processes again. Um, it is a, a step by step process here. So if you wanted to regenerate the surface for some reason, you just go back into surface generation. The way that we send the data out is to uh, send to, there's a send to function for your project. And basically this says send to um, Turnbull Business Center or Survey Office, uh, which is another package that we can send data out to. And then you just select the data from the system that you want, the, the data that you've created and is being held in UAS Master back to TBC or the other, um, the Survey Office. Now, be aware that when you're sending data back to TBC, you do have the option to send back your ground control points or your um, photo, photo locations and your strips and those sorts of things. Um, TBC doesn't necessarily need that information. Um, unless you really need that information, I wouldn't tick that on. I'd just send your point cloud and your ortho photo back to, to TBC and then click next. This will send the data or package it up, send it across to TBC. Now, if you have TBC open when you do this, which you should have, um, in the project that you want the data to come into, TBC will bring up a window and say, um, "Can uh, it's I've got some data to come in. Uh, do you want me to import the data? Yes, you import the data and then it's ready to go in TBC. Again, at this point, you can also just go to the folder location and find the, the, the DTM and the ortho photos, or you can just export that information out and not have an issue with regards to um, you know, running through TBC if that's if that's what you wanted to do. So the send and receive notification that you'd have in TBC when it's open would be, um, do you want to accept the data that's coming in? In this case, you select accept. Accept will um, start to import the data coming from TBC. And then once it's in, you'll see the point cloud in TBC and be able to just use the functionality from TBC. Um, there's no real trick or set of steps now because the data will be handled as an imported point cloud into TBC and the ortho photo will be handled as an ortho photo in, in TBC as well. So um, all the traditional steps and processes that we've talked about in previous workflows can now be utilized um, against the point cloud. So by that, when I say the traditional steps and points, the, you know, the point cloud module in TBC, yes, it's a, ne a separate um, module to the photogrammetry module, but it is worth having if you're looking down the photogrammetry path because you can classify regions, sample data down so you don't need to deal with the one-to-one -one relationship of your terrain model. You can look at a lower resolution um, set of de point density and that will allow you to essentially generate a more easily to manage surface. You can extract ground points out so you can actually run that extract ground function, not worry about getting buildings and trees out. Um, and you can just get the ground out quite easily using that in the point cloud mo module and also the scan to CAD. So if you were doing say a paddock and you wanted to put a point every 10 meters through the paddock and have CAD points there that you can put a, a label against and then export that out to say a drafting package that you would use or use those points for some other reason, scan to CAD is very good at, at, at helping through that. Um, just be aware that when you're running the point clouds tool option in TBC, <clears throat> there are some things to be aware that the surfaces will be handled slightly differently, particularly for buildings, um, because there's no vertical point cloud to work with. So it doesn't necessarily identify a building in that process. However, with that said, the building will just be put on the default layer and you can shift roofs to, to a building layer if you want to manually. Um, digitization can be done against the point cloud once it's in TBC. So using the CAD tools that we've discussed in the, the point cloud uh, session that we ran, those sorts of things can be done if you've got your FXL in to make sure that you're getting your line work and your points and things out. Um, then once you've done that, you can generate your surfaces and do the contours and remove elements and, and all of that sort of aspect that you would do. Um, you can compare designs and from surfaces from the UAV that you've created against say, um, to sort of produce cut fill reports. So if you've done some work in TBC and you've got a design surface, you could do that comparison um, from drone data uh, quite easily. 
in TBC as well as other subsequent reports. And also, of course, you can use UAV data to match up against existing um, terrestrial scanning data from, say, an X7, an SX10, a TX scan, or all of that, as well as imported data. Um, all of that can be used to match up if you've got everything referenced in or if you need to shift it around and identify the location of data, that can be all done in TBC as well. So when you're processing in UAS Master, there's some things to be aware of. Like I was saying before, if you are looking at things like a roof line, for example, I would recommend getting a shot to the corner or something that can be seen in the roof line from the aerial photos that you can then pull the, you can tie that point cloud to. This example here is a roof line where the ground was processed and the roof line didn't sit properly against where it should have been. However, once we put some GCPs on that roof line, it was pulled up and sits where it should be. The problem with vertical heights in, um, in UAS, like in any UAV data, is that it's hard to identify from photos without any form of sort of side on shot. So if you're just doing straight down photo, uh, photogrammetry work, it, it is hard to identify um, heights to a very accurate degree. So in order to improve your accuracy, you should try and put GCPs in spots that uh, are related to what you are trying to get out of the system. Now, you don't have to put millions of GCPs through. It's just enough to make sure that you have the confidence that the height in that area is related to what you are looking at. Um, GCPs, as I said, can be related, can be created from manual data. So in the example of the roof line here, we have actually just picked some points from a, that were available to us from a scan. Um, so they weren't actually uh, necessarily a, a, a recorded GCP, like a, a cross. It was just a scan point on the edge of the building that we could probably see from the from the sky. Now, I know it's not too, like 100% accurate, but it does make that improvement and the system does work at it, its way around that and can manage that. Um, so a GPS measurement is not necessarily essential. You can even just go out and shoot your GCP locations um, with a total station if you want. Just remember, it has to be in a spot that is out, um, like it's not between buildings or under a tree or that sort of thing. It needs to be in a spot that you can quite easily see everywhere in all your photos out in the open um, wherever possible because it will make the processing a lot easier and um, you won't have essentially wasted photos where things have gone under trees. Um, when, you're gener when you're generating that surface step, remember that the I was saying that there was the ability to turn off photo to say I want a minimum number of photos um, to be used or a maximum number of photos to be used. Um, if your minimum number of photos is too high, you'll find that you have a very small point cloud um, if, or you may not be able to generate one at all. The reason for this is that there's just not enough photos to generate the information from. You may also find that the, if the minimum, you, you'll find that your surface may not be as good. You can sort of go the other way. So it is a bit of a, a play to get used to what, what settings to use. And I'd recommend finding a small area, doing a small job initially and doing a couple of tests on that small job to work out what best suits you, your process and also your camera um, so that you can have that confidence that the settings you have uh, are not being sort of wasted wasted time. Um, different, uh, as I was saying too, different surface generation techniques will provide different results. So um, in that, uh, the topography surface generation is just a very basic look at the terrain, whereas a SGM um, surface generation will give you quite a detailed model against buildings and that sort of thing. That's not to say that SGM can't be used for natural surface and that CVM can't be used for um, for buildings. The thing to note with those two is that you may find that an SGM um, is better for blacktop and roofs and those sorts of things. You won't get so much warping where there's a, a data that is very similar. Um, again, one of the traps for UAS pro, uh, for UAV processing is that if you're flying over an area 
that is very similar in all the photos and there isn't a lot of dis differencing the systems any system will start to struggle with returning a, a decent looking point cloud you start to see warping and those sorts of things so the SGM and CGM techniques in UAS Master are used to try and improve that process so that um, for natural surface we can get a better point cloud out you're not getting so, so much of that noise or that that warping and in um, CBM you're, you're getting good roof lines and um, a good set of results over say blacktop which which can like for tarmac which can be a pain to to process um, I you, it's a simple one but it does happen don't shift your GCPs after processing because you process because you process the data against a GCP um, that location is now fixed so I wouldn't be sending the data to UAS master until you have your final locations for all of your GCP points and that they're not going to shift um, once the data comes back in. If you shift the GCP location for some reason um, in relationship to everything else, I would reprocess the data. Now this this doesn't mean if you're shifting onto datum and that sort of thing, this is more just tweaking individual point locations although in, in, that, in that sort of area. Um, if you're tweaking individual locations then that's gonna have an impact on the rest of the model. So if you if you're finding that your model is poor, then maybe go back and have a look at your GCP locations and make sure that they're all correct in relationship to one another. Um, but just be aware that once you've processed your data, it needs to be tied to that GCP and that, that now should be fixed. Um, I know it's a simple one, but it, it does happen and we have had cases where users have sort of tried to shift stuff around. Um, the final one in these tips here would be when combining data sets, make sure the GCPs have a relationship to the data. Um, so in, in that regards, make sure that your aerial data has some form of relation, the aerial data has some relationship to the points collected in the field. Um, it's very hard to tie projects together that you don't, you have different set of points in your ground work as to the aerial work. Um, so just try and do a couple of extra shots to make sure that there's a, that tie between your groundwork and your aerial data. So let's look at uh, UAS Master itself. Um, I'm just going to check. Shep's answering some questions as we go through, so that's good. Um, I'm going to start by opening TBC, and I'll share that screen. I'll just share my desktop. So we'll, have, we'll start with TBC. Um, as you all know, this is TBC. We've got a blank project. I'm going to create a new project. Now, this new project here is a project that is going to be on GDA 2020. It's just a blank template. I've got my FXL in here. The projection has been set um, because I know that's in relationship to my data that I'm, I'm going to be importing. Uh, now, if I look at my project here, I go to my job and I import my control data. So in this regards, um, my control data is in a CSV file and what we're going to do is we're going to import the CSV file which has my control point locations so it's point elevation northing and we're going to select control now when importing data into TBC you can have control and you can have unknown control will be handled as a control point in TBC and unknown import will not have that control quality associated with it so if you have control points and you're importing points that are going to be static and used in that control process i would import them always making sure that you have them as control selected in these options if you have points northing easting for example you can change that in this list as well so you just select import and our points have been imported into tbc so you can see our points here quite Happily, they're sitting here. Um, if I turn on my background maps, so down the bottom, um, you can turn on the background maps. This is the background maps. So this is the mapping. By default, it will come up with the maps, but you can see the points are still there. It can be hard to see with background maps turned on. So what you can do in the Project Explorer is go to Properties. And in my properties, I can change this to Digital Globe Imagery and that will put in the photos. So there is that option to switch between background maps such as Google Earth and Digital Globe. Um, just making sure that there's no problems. So 
once we've got this data, we're ready to go to UAS Master. So we can select the points because these are the points I want to send to UAS Master. Go to the photogrammetry tab, send to UAS Master. In this, this is that screenshot we looked at earlier, but we've got the version that we want to go to. Um, you can install multiple versions of UAS Master on your machine. Uh, I personally would try and stick to the most current and up-to-date version and make sure your older versions are uninstalled because there's little reason to go back to a previous version at the moment. The, the current versions are quite good. Traditionally, there was a need at times to go between versions, but yeah, look, the options there if you needed it. There's the coordinate system that we have set. You can change that if you need to um, here for whatever reason, but we will leave it. There's also an option to send more information, but really we're just wanting to send the ground control points and go OK. What this will do is we'll open UAS Master and when you open UAS Master, you'll have this option that says import from business center. It gives you an import project file. If I select this, I'm then going to go to my UAS Master um, location here. I'm going to find a location to save the data. I'm going to call this um, Mega Training 2. Now, I've got a previous project um, in here called Mega Training. Uh, that's where I've run this process already. I'm going to call that project up uh, down the track because uh, it will just save the processing time. But the rest of it we will do live on the fly, which is why you know this is going to be fun, maybe. Um, over on the right and the left here, you will see in the UAS master window, you have your previous projects. You can also see up the top here, there's UAS area mapping and close range. If you open up UAS master just as a standalone application and create your project that way, you bypass this create um, step, this one here. The other one you can do is if you were sending data that was close range data from TBC, you could set that here as well. So um, all of that can be handled in this, this import process. You go OK and it opens a new window. Now at the moment, it doesn't look like there's anything in here. However, if I fit to view, you can see my GCPs. Um, as I rotate around, there's no relationship or anything with it, but I, if I right mouse click on the red, I can see the, the rotate sort of up and down and then left and right, and I can swivel around if I highlight. And as you put your mouse over something, it will highlight that, that particular thing, or you just click in the dome and, and um, it will rotate arbitrary. So the first step that you would do is you go to edit. In edit, it will open up the edit window and we this is where we're starting to import the data. Now, as you'll notice, we've come through, the system already knows that it's GDA 2020, it's in zone 55, it's got all the associated parameters that with it. This is tied to that underlying coordinate system uh, that is in TBC. You'll also notice that we have five points. The five points are the five points that we've imported. The first step that we would do is we go to frame type and we select, um, double, you just double click on it, you go to import, um, import photos. Now you go add a directory, you can add files or you can add subdirectories. So if you've gone out on multiple days and you've got multiple days worth of uh, flights in one folder, then, or sorry, in multiple folders, you can select all those folders. Or you can select one folder and it'll import all the folders that are inside that folder. Um, adding a directory will just import the photos in that folder and adding a file would be if you just want to manually select the files that you want to import. So we're going to add a directory in this place. I'm going to go to the 120 meter, select this folder, go next. This is a set of options that allows you to rename um, the photo locations if you wanted to, and then you see the names here of what those photos are. Generally, they're all pretty fine, and that's that's not a big deal. I forgot to mention that this is used flown using a Mavic 2 drone, so um, it's a DJI Mavic 2. It's a fairly low-end drone. Uh, this is a representation that, yes, it can be used. I wouldn't recommend using this particular drone because they're just the unknowns associated with it. I'd prefer, it would be better to use, say, Phantom 4 RTK, but um, for the benefit of this demonstration, uh, yes, I'm showing that it, we can show that it can be done. And I would also, you know, it, it is usable for an entry level if you were, if you were looking at that very basic entry level um, package. So if we go to the next one, this option here, we can look at what um, data we've 
like what we do with the data and also the um, measurements. So it's the input settings of that data that we're looking at. The main thing to remember here is the mean terrain height. This is not the terrain height that is flown. This is what your mean terrain height of your project is. You can get this from TBC by just examining um, one of the points or a couple of the points and it's just an average. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be absolutely specific and bang on, um, but you just want an average sort of something as a starting point. So 40 is the starting, is the average height in this case and we'll go next. Now it's just essentially a validation check, finish, and we've got all of our photos in here. So we've got a height, we've got the names of the photos. You'll also notice here that, that it has identified from the EXIF data some information from the camera. This is just the basic information from the camera. It's telling the system what type of camera is being used, what the resolution of the photo is, where the coordinates are, all of that sort of thing. <clears throat> in here too, if you select all, so I've just gone control A, select all, there's a calculate terrain height. You can go 120. This is the flight height that we've, um, uh, we've flown. So this is where you would specify what your flight height is. It's not necessarily going to make a huge difference, but it is good to put that information in to make sure that it's it's accounted for. And we're going to go OK. And now we've got 24 photos that we've imported into our project. In the GNSS IMU, here is where we're looking at the actual coordinates of the photos. Um, this step, because of the um, quality of the camera, I'm going to change the Amiga, the Phi and the Kappa to 10, 10 and 20. Um, this is just to help with the um, just the tolerance is set. If the lower values are going to be fairly specific and we not necessarily going to see problems, but problems can start to creep in and you may start to miss photos if they've, if they've swayed out of, out of um, um, paths and those sorts of things. So for a low end camera, I'd put these settings in to work with them. Go OK, apply and yes, and then OK. And then we now have that sort of confidence there. Now you can generate your strips. So we don't have to import the strips from anywhere else, but they don't have to be calculated. What we're going to do is we're just going to click generate and this shows you all the photos. We have an um, the ability to change the tolerance and the, the distance tolerance. So the other, for, if you're flying close strips to one another, you may want to change these settings. Um, the same way if you want, if you're flying with quite a large distance between your photos, you would want to change these settings too, just to capture um, where the flight paths are. Now, if you if you generate the strips and these settings are wrong, you'll see that in once you go back to the main view here. So you can come back and, and update that if you need to. So we're going to go next, finish, and I now have four strips that are generated. This is showing you the photo IDs or the names of the photos, how many photos were in each strip, uh, the azimuths that, that, that were on, and what they are. We'll go OK. And that's it. That's us importing the data. Now up here, there's an explosion button and it looks like something's going to go wrong. Basically, this is just a validation check. If there are some major issues with it, this will be where it's coming up. We don't have any problems in this case. So I'll click Save and I'll close this window. Now you'll notice that we've populated the background here with the images and the, the strips. Um, now if I rotate around, you'll see the flight path is above where the GCPs want. Now you want to, when you're doing a basic check and your data's in UAS Master, you want to make sure that this is, that it all looks fine. You don't want your flight paths to be sitting below your GCP locations or anything like that. This is this is a basic check to make sure that where your flight height is is correct against your GCPs and that everything sort of lines up. When I say lines up, you want to make sure that your GCP locations, so these green triangles here, are underneath the flight path because, of course, if they're not, if there's no relationship here, the system will struggle in going to the next step. Okay, the next step is the georeferencing. So over here, you'll see that the georeferencing tool is open or has become available to us. So the first thing that it will do is it will run through the steps. Thankfully, today, this is now working. Um, thanks, Shep. Um, you can see here the all the, the strips that we've got and also the photo locations. It's a block, it's a top-down view, but we're seeing where the relationship of the photos are to one another. Um, there's also a topo view, which you can see where if you start to zoom in and out, you'll see the, the photos in sort of more a, a realistic representation. We can 
change the stamp size here to small, medium and large. And if I go over to the left here and select the photos, um, again, control A, and then right mouse click display activate, you can now see in the main view here, the relationship of the photos to one another. A good check here is to make sure the data makes sense. So um, you know that um, the, the photos are rotated the correct way, the orientation is correct, all of that is what you, you're checking here to make sure that um, the, the data has, has, has come in correctly. You'll also notice that in each of these, the, there you, we're now starting to see multiple GCPs. This is the approximation of where the system is seeing the GCP location in that particular photo. So that's what's going on here. Really, these are just validation checks at this initial stage. So the first thing you would do would be a tie point extraction. So we're going up the top right. I'm just going to run a, a normal tie point extraction. These basic settings are, are pretty good. Um, also, the reason why I'm running it at this setting is that it's it's relatively quick to do this tie point stage. Um, the system at this point goes through and just does basic calculations of where all the points are, what's what's going on in all the photos, creates these tie points. And um, <clears throat> what you'll see is when it comes, when uh, the process is completed, um, any errors that come up in here will become as errors and warnings and the process will stop. If that's the case, then there is something that you will need to go back and investigate. In this case, it's worked. It took 30 seconds, close. We can now see all a field of little dots through the screen. Um, hopefully you can all see that there. Um, those dots are representing the tie points. You'll also notice that um, in our points list here, we now have lots of, um, lots of new tie points. So we've got GCPs up the top as well as the tie points that have been generated. I'm gonna change this over here to GCP and check only. So GCP and check only, will say in this points list, I only want to see the GCP um, or checkpoints. Now you can have checkpoints or GCPs. Um, checkpoints are more used to, to make sure that you are in the right location as opposed to having a physical impact on shifting the, um, the point cloud around. So with this step done, you if I go back to my cloud back here, um, there is no change, but when we click OK, we will start to see this, this information update. We're going to run the measure step now. So if I go to measure and we're going to measure GCPs, what I do is I select the first GCP and what this comes up with is the views of the images and where the system is determining or has approximated where the um, the photo, like the, the GCP is. So. The system is saying that the, the calculated point is here, whereas we actually want the point to be up here. So the first thing that you can do here is you can select two points like this and go complement and refine by least squares matching. And what that will do is it will say, here's where I think the point is, here's where you're telling me the point is. I'll go through all of the photos and make that adjustment and calculation based on the information that I have. You can, the different options here, will do different things in the sense that some will change the location of the point that you have selected to make it more accurate and some won't. I'd recommend using complement and refine by least squares matching here. You run that quickly and it runs through. What you'll notice up the top here is that through here, we now have some green and blue and also some, some areas that have nothing. So green means yes, I've it, the system has accurately decided that it's, it's identified the correct point. Blue is the point that you have, the, the photo that you've used as your reference. And the other ones are ones that, yes, it's got close. So down in the bottom right here, you can see, yes, it's got close, but it's not confident that it's been able to identify it. So it hasn't fully identified that picture. If I select four, two or one, these are different zoom settings for all of the images. The other thing you can do is collect the move to button and that will move to the point that it has been calculated. So if you select this four, four to one that is zoomed into that location on all the images and then move to will select this so you can better see the images. If I select over here and I rerun that process again, you'll notice now that I have green all the way through. Um, there is more zoom settings if you wanted, one to eight, one to 16, one to 32. So basically you would go through and go back. So run that again 
you'll see that we've done this again. Now that you've run that step, you can zoom in. And if I scroll through my photos here, you can see that um, I can make some adjustments on the fly and complement and fine. Now we're, now we're happy. You can also change the number of photos that you're viewing simultaneously. So if you wanted to add more, there it is there. Then you can see now 16 photos in this block that's done through here to scroll left and right through pages of photos that's that's up there too. So now I've identified that one. I'm going to go through and quickly identify the last of them. Uh, so I'm just going to pick that point there and that one there. Complement refine. Now this that initial complement refine is just fairly basic. So once you do it the first time, you can just do it. Uh, it makes your life a little bit easier. Run that step again. Now I've gone through most of those ones. Uh, it's that one there that's having a problem. So now it's now it's checked them all. Now with this particular one here, what we'll do is we'll do the same step and run that process. Now I can go by move two. What you'll notice is that this photo here is under a tree and I don't, while I, you could approximate it, um, I'm just going to leave it. So you don't actually have to pick all your photos and have all your photos matched up. The more information that it has in the background, the better. However, I, I can't see that, that point. So um, we're just going to leave it. The system will, will just identify over here. Yes, it's got nine photos, um, but it's only been able to do eight links to the nine photos. So it's yellow in that regard. Um, over here, this one here, this is saying it's got eight photos that it predicts where that, that point is located. No links to it, so it's red. So this is something would need to be done with this one. This one is telling you that there is not all the photo, all the predictions have a, a link to it, um, but we're, we're confident that um, there are eight and that will be sufficient for this case, whereas the others have all the, the links to them. Um, you know, it's up to you how many is your minimum, um, but you know, wherever possible, try and get as many photos to, to link to a point as possible. So this is the last one, complement and refine. You can't do this move to step until you've done a complement and refine, just as a note, because it's moving to where this white triangle is. And if you haven't, if you haven't done a, um, a refine process it or any one of these three, it won't know where to shift that to. So you won't have any benefit for running that move to option. So now I've done all of those, I can run an orientation. So this is just a quick um, calibration against what we've, what we've told the system based on the information now. Start that process again. So this will take a re, this will reinvestigate all the information in the project and based on what it now knows is the location of the GCPs. Um, it's a fairly quick step. And um, once you've run this step, you'll be able to <coughs> um, proceed. Um, it's, you know, you can you can run the orientation step again. You can run the tie point step again. It's it's up to you how you how many times you want to run these these sorts of processes. Um, it, it can have benefits. In this case, we're just going to do a, a basic straight through example um, and a, a straight through workflow to try and make sure that we get just a, a good result out. So if I close this now, um, in our tool options over here. Uh, no, sorry, now properties over here, we can start to show bits of information if you want. So in the properties, you could turn on point statistics. So um, they're not coming up at the moment, but there are some options in here that you can, um, you can use to highlight the information that you are seeing on screen. So once you've done this, um, you've run through all those steps. Um, you can look at the report. So the report is that detailed report that we were talking about before. So when the report opens, it's just going to be PDF. This will always be generated. You'll see that there is a whole heap of information here based on um, sort of the different outputs of the report. Um, there's general project information, which will tell you what type of machine that you're running on. So as you can see here, these are my machine specs. Um, so if you're wondering what you know what I'm running, then this is this is the information here with regards to that. It's not it's not a horrible laptop, but it's not a high end desktop processing machine either. So um, you know it's it's fairly quick. Then we have a look at the quick flight overview. So in the background there, you can see um, 
some you might be able to see a fine scattering of points at the GCP locations based on where um, our flight path is. Uh, there's tie point dist um, distribution, so this is where um, how many points, of, how many photos of tie point has been found in. So the red it's found in zero to three images, whereas blue is, is greater than nine images. Um, that point has been identified in. This was run as a weak one. If you ran it against one of the higher settings, you'll find that there are more tie points. But in saying in running with more tie points, the, the process will be a bit slower. Um, then you start to look at the image, the, the image point locations, the frequency of image points observations, the histogram of image point frequency. Um, you start to get into some detailed camera calibration at this point. Um, so it has reverse engineered what the camera is doing based on the photos and what we're, we're saying. Uh, the polynomial distortion table, if that's what floats your boat. Um, there is a distortion graphic here. So this is a bit better than looking at necessarily that table. It's showing you where the optimal location of the camera is and where the shift is occurring based on the lens. Um, there's an image residuals um, graph here of what sort of points are doing on, on the against the image. Um, and then just general information that can get quite detailed with relation to um, what has gone on and where photos are located and also um, its confidence in identifying the points. This one, um, this ground point control residuals looks at how far the points have been shifted or the photos have been shifted against the ground points. So you can sort of have a representation. If you had long lines all over the place for this one, I'd recommend going back and looking at your ground point locations as well as um, just your what's going on in the project. Um, and then standard deviations for your ground controls. And that's that's the report. Now this report is stored automatically when um, it generates that orientation. So that create uh, report tool would just rerun that process, but it's already been run when you've done the orientation. So now if I close this, the main view updates, you can see all the white dots in the background there. We've got our green, um, our green locations now saying that all of these are ready to go. We're going to run the radiometric uh, optimization. So start that. It'll just go through my 24 photos and extract the color information and make sure that it's all correct. Um, and then makes its modifications. It's a fairly quick step. Close that. And now we go to the surface and ortho generation. So in this step, this is where in the background you can see this is the editing options within UAS Master. Um, it it's where you could edit the point cloud if you have one. Um, we don't currently have a point cloud generated, so we can go in. I'm going to run a 2.5G uh, SGM. So the minimum number of models here, you can change that up and down, a maximum number, the flow um, texture areas, sorry, filter load texture areas. So you can say to the system, I don't want um, low textures and those sorts of things, dependent on some settings. Um, and there are a whole heap of other settings within here that can help you improve. I'd recommend when you're starting out in UAS Master to look at just the model type, um, run each one of them as you would see fit, and then um, underneath do your extraction level. Now, uh, because it was running at about seven minutes for, for processing this in my um, test, I am going to go back and I'm going to open the project that I've done. So this in that surface generation tool, um, you'll see the same settings as before. We've got the surface generation now. This is what's come out of this particular project. Um, we've got an ortho photo generation tool, which you can do. You have your different options for generating an ortho photo, classic, true, quick, and ortho photo from point cloud. Um, all of that can be done quite quickly in, in UAS Master as well. I haven't generated one in this particular case, but um, it's it's quite easy to do. It's just a secondary step. So once you've run and generated your, your project, the point cloud will be updated in here and you can now rotate around, see what the point cloud looks like, see the relationship against the photos um, and all of that information within the, the project is now stored in this view. So we've got this view, we can now go to send to. So we go project send to, this is the what we were talking about before. The send to window has point clouds, DMs, ortho photos vector data, cameras, all of this can be sent to TBC if you wanted to. Um, I'm just going to send the point cloud. So I'm going to go next. UAS Masters packaged it up. We're going to go send. And at this point, 
we're essentially done with UAS master and TBC is opened because I had TBC already open in the background. It's saying um, there's data awaiting import and you select accept. And in TBC that now um, imports the data. It takes a little bit of time because it's you know importing that that point cloud from UIS master. However, when it's imported, it knows where it's located. It's positioned according to everything that we've talked about <coughs> already. So it's really just a general import step. This is saying that it's finished. You can close close your process view, and our terrain model is here. So now we've got our terrain model back in TBC. All of our functions are available to us. Um, that we've traditionally had. Um, you can zoom in and out, you can see your points. If I go to the point cloud tab, I can change the size of my points again, small, medium and large. You can look at the terrain, see what, what's come out. Now in here, if I select here and I go extract ground, this will just run a process where instead of trying to do buildings and trees, it's just going to extract the ground. So I've only got one um, point cloud region. So that's the ground here. In the ground now, you can you could essentially go straight through and run a surface. You could select this and go sample region. Let's do a sample region at um, 0.5. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to drop the density of the points down so that when we're when we've got our data, um, we're going to just put a spacing at 0.5. We're going to go store. This will copy the point from the ground region that we've got here to a new region. It's not going to take the point from the um, the ground region. It's just copying a, a point to a new or telling that point that it's on two regions now. So it's a lower density um, set of points here compared to what we were dealing with previously, which again will generate a better terrain. Um, if we go through and use the polygon select tool now, if I run this set of steps through here. I just say I wanted to just run the surface through there. Surfaces, create surface, new surface, go OK. This is going to take those points that we've just generated and we've now created a surface. So if I turn my point cloud off, here's the surface that we've generated from the process that we've just done. Now, if you want, you can cut out sections in TBC to say, I don't want any surface generated through these areas. Um, we can create holes quite happily in TBC, um, but a surface can be quite quickly generated. If you want to create contours, go to create contours, say the contour interval of 0.5. Um, my index frequency is five, so we'll change the major and minors. So my major contours are now gonna be a slightly purple color. I'm going to just put zero and go OK. There's my, if I turn my surface off now, there's my contour model against the terrain with major and minor contours turned on, the GCP information. If we wanted to, uh, we can also go back and look at our scans. So uh, if I turn on my ground points and I go through, I select the ground, if we go back to our point cloud tab, we can go scan to CAD. So here we go. I'm going to put 50 meter spacings between my points. Go apply. And if I turn the, I now have 50 meter spacing points. So that's them there. I can put, I can put labels against those points. I, um, when I do that, uh, I can go to the drafting tab and in the drafting tab, I can select points and we can select the points that we want. To select the points that we want, we can go um, points drafting. Uh, TBC is decided, oh, there we are. Go here, I can go options and go select similar. So selecting similar, I can select the point that I want and go okay. That's now selected the 26 points that I've done. So in the selection sets in TBC, you don't have to select all or manage. You can just select points based on the similar set, set of properties and then go add. And now I have text applied against all of those points. Now, as you'll notice in my text here, um, I've got a question mark above it. The reason for that is that the label style for that is a um, point and uh, then the height there. I can remove that, that text and go OK. And if I wanted to, I could also put that text at 45 degrees. So if I get point 
select that 45 and go OK. And when you've done that, if I look at my plan view now, I now have my top down points at 45 degrees throughout the surface. I've got my contour model through the middle here. Um, uh, we've got a surface and it's been quite quick to generate that, that information straight out of TBC. From here, you could do one of your general reports if you had a comparison report to run against or you could do all of that sort of functionality quite easily. Um, it's, it's up to you sort of what tools you use in TBC and is available to you. Uh, if you've created pads or um, corridors, you could do surface difference reports, all of that can be managed. So that's essentially the process of the workflow. Um, with that said, I'll now open the floor up. Um, I'm going to unmute the audience. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Um, I've got uh, Shep here as well. So um, he may be able to answer anything a bit more complex if you have any. I know that there's a bit to it, but once you have a workflow down pat with UAS Master, it is actually quite easy. Um, it's just going to be dependent upon essentially what drone you're flying with and what you're sort of looking to, to get as your output. So um, in terms of PPK processing, it is actually looking to be more of a shift to um, uh, Shep, you might be able to be more specific on this. We are shifting that more to the TBC workflow. So the it will be progressed more on a TBC side than a UAS master side. Um, that's that's so the question was any progress on PBK processing with UAS master um, and using P, uh, Phenom for RTKs with a Trimble base. The answer essentially at the moment is that it is being shifted. The whole process essentially will be shifted gradually to you. Trimble Business Center, um, but that's where what the solution is currently. You can unmute if you want, Shep. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Let me see. Unmute. There you go. You should be right to go now. Okay, is that working now? No yeah, feedback? Yep. Uh, so the ongoing uh, builds for working with the Phantom for RTK, um, they will occur so that the post-processing workflows are actually in TBC. Um, we have the engines for post-processing of uh, GNSS already embedded in there, so it makes sense to put that in there, whereas UAS Master is a dedicated photogrammetry package. It doesn't contain any GNSS processing at current. Um, so the, the workflows are um, in current uh, sort of focus and, and they will come out um, within the next 12 months. Um, if you wanted to perform RTK with a Trimble base, uh, we can facilitate that in a number of different ways, either over the Wi-Fi contained in most of our um, better models of GNSS. Um, through IBSS and also through utilising a uh, extranet SIM, which is a SIM card that allows you to push the uh, corrections out through a uh, wide area network, which is something that's a little bit unique to Telstra. It actually locks wide area network on most SIM cards and pushing data through. Did you have anything else to add with that whole process, Shep? Um, what else had we covered there? In the tie point extraction, um, where Ross went through and mentioned that you could actually go through and do the orientations and then go back in and extract the tie points again. It's something that is a little bit more unique to some uh, package like this where it's a dedicated photogrammetry package. You can iterate. So initially, we don't have a camera model unless the camera contains some form of calibration um, that's known. Uh, some cameras actually feed through a generic distortion model for their lens. Um, but with drones uh, specifically, the cameras are highly dynamic. So you change the temperature, you change the lens parameters. We can iterate quite well to be able to 
run the tie points, it'll generate a rough orientation model and then rerun the tie points. And what you'll see comes through is more dense tie points because we now know more about the lens characteristics where we're building up that. And we can also build up where Ross for speed and efficiency ran a weak um, tie point extraction. You could run weak, high and then highest, but it's actually medium, high and highest. Um, and what this does is it changes the area that we look at for tie points. So in areas of low uh, geometry where let's say we were looking at um, a flat tailings dam where there's really not much textural change, um, we might want to look at a larger swathe of area um, and using the medium extraction allows that and then something that's highly detailed we could use the highest and it has a, a a relationship with the amount of pixels that are being used to find those tie points. Um, in the US Master Reference Manual, there's quite a good diagram of how this is being um, maybe decimated is the easiest term, but uh, looking at a larger patch of, of pixels to determine its tie points. Yeah, I mean, look, overall, US Master we're not going to shy away from the fact it is a photogrammetry package. Um, the thing to note with it is that you can use it quite simply and easily with a, a standardized workflow, but it will give you that confidence that you can build up and make more detailed decisions um, <coughs> on the fly. And similar to um, other things like within TBC, you can run that, that streamlined workflow quite happily and not need to worry about the more detailed aspects but you can also dive in and make changes and edits which gives you a little bit of flexibility that if something goes wrong you can manage that um, in the package itself and you don't need to sort of take the data out or break it down or things like that. Um, UAS Master has come a long way in the last two years for simplicity and ease of access so um, if you have used it in the past, I would recommend using it again in the new version so that you can just see what it can do. We found that um, things that it used to trip up on and have issues with are now quite good um, in UAS Master. And you will also see moving forward, the functionality will shift um, in sort of stages through to TBC as well so that TBC can handle that processing and, and that data. You're not relying on going out. But like we say also, UAS Master, if you just want to use UAS Master and you don't want to use TBC, you can do that workflow as well. So there is that flexibility there. Yeah, it is uh, definitely a, a very capable um, package and the, the potential for more options for those that want to seek a better model are in there. Um, but with that becomes the requirement that you need to have a deeper understanding of what you're actually playing with and the photogrammetric parameters. Um, probably one thing to put in there in the workflow, you created some strips. Uh, if you're using the SGM um, uh, surface generation, which is called a semi-global matching, um, the way that that engine works is my understanding is the strips aren't as required now. Uh, because of how that engine is actually finding um, the surface points and generating them. Uh, but it really, it takes a few seconds to do that. A bit unique in this, um, in the photogrammetric market for software, we've actually pulled it from our larger suite of info uh, and cut it down into the UAS master product. But some things that remain there that aren't in any other drone processing for people that are doing a lot of this and are really wanting to pick out a lot of roofline details or um, things that exist in vertical. You, you can use uh, a 3D immersion box, which is where the, uh, the monitor will display a left and a right image for your eyes in sequence, and you have special glasses to be able to see it in 3D. Um, it can also be roughly approximated by another setting where you use what's called anaglyph glasses, which are a red and a blue um, set of glasses that can be obtained quite cheaply. And that gives you uh, quite a good view in the three-dimensional aspect um, without having to be in a point cloud because you do lose a little bit of information in point cloud matching. Um, and this is giving you the true um, two image pairs so that you can run what we used to do on those uh, photogrammetry benches that weighed about two tonne and no one knew how to do in the past and then 
uh, sort of high-end photogrammetric software as well. So for people that are really just in that photogrammetry space, um, it's a pretty unique piece of software to do that at the price point that it is. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah. Look, you know the the other option that Trimble has is is um, Stratus, which if you're just sort of doing surface differences, um, SciTech workflows that tend to be a bit better done in, in Stratus where you can actually share a TTM into the cloud and, and it's cloud-based processing, but the, it sits at the other end where it's it's pretty much a black box, whereas UAS Master is taking that black box element away and you are, you're really focusing on giving you the control of getting what you want out of it. So there are a whole heap of options in there. And as Shep's saying, there's sort of unique functionality to take you to that next level if, if that's where you're looking to go. Um, Probably just one last thing. The uh, It gets talked about in the photogrammetric space a little bit is a reality mesh. Uh, UAS Master's been generating these for the last few versions now as well in the OBJ format as amongst uh, a few others. And they are... Uh, a little bit of a, a balance between the information in a point cloud, the information in the images, and wrapping a three-dimensional mesh around an object so that as you zoom in, you don't get that uh, that view where as you get closer to the points, it appears to be quite sparse. Uh, these basically create a bit of infill from the photos as well. So they're becoming uh, pretty broadly used. I suppose the final thing on all of this um, is that don't forget there is also the the close range photogrammetry option in UAS Master, which, as I said, it, to start with, is a slightly different stream, same package. It all comes part of it, but that will allow you to do sort of, if you wanted um, more like vertical scans um, for like construction or um, archaeological surveying or you know um, historical mo monitoring all those sorts of things could be done more in that vertical realm um, with close range photogrammetry using the same tools the same familiarity um, but it's it's specifically tailored for dealing with that vertical face so close range photogrammetry is also an option in there as well so it's it is quite a complete package for all of that um, yes, it's probably the a, a little bit of marketing um, in there where we it's been dubbed close range photogrammetry, but um, the the engine is dealing with photos that are captured beyond thirty degrees from Nadir. So normally um, traditional flight path, you had the the um, aircraft or facing the camera straight down, um, and you might have a tolerance out to thirty degrees from that straight down. Close range will deal with it coming right around from any particular angle. So you can do a, three, uh, a reconstruction of terrestrial photos where you don't have any geotags to begin with. You can do a reconstruction of flying uh, um, electricity towers or um, like a, a tower where you would do a, a spiraling um, capture to come up and around the object. Any of that is possible in there, which the area mapping wouldn't deal with, but area mapping is geared for large scale um, Nadir mapping where it's because we're splitting out those two engines and focusing on two different workflows, uh, they, they maintain their efficiency in doing that. All right, well, on that, thank you very much for everyone for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. I hope everyone found it useful. Uh, I know there's a lot in it and it's a slightly different package to use. It's also using slightly different workflows to what we've talked about with everything else this month so far. Um, we have recorded this session. I will run the session again next week um, for anyone that might want to see it again or if anyone misses out. So um, yeah, look, I hope it was interesting and you found it useful. And again, let me know if you have any questions. I'll put my name down. That's my email address down there if anyone wants it. Um, if you want to go, have a go, it's part of the 30-day trials that we're, um, we're offering out at the moment. Uh, if you want more information in terms of pricing and those sorts of things, please talk to our team. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in future sessions. Thanks, guys.